started this morning on the book of Amos, and I have uh, with me this evening a simple outline of the book for those of you that would like to spend more time in studying it on your own. An introduction in verse 1, the lion roars, the first sermon of Amos in the book, uh, which we looked at this morning. Then uh, a second sermon which he preached, moral and spiritual collapse, uh, which preceded an invasion, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 through 6, 14, and then a final Sermon, Visions of Judgment, some seven visions which Amos has regarding the nation of Israel, 7, 1 through 9, 10. And finally, there is an epilogue, a prophetic word which looks forward to the distant, it wasn't to Amos distant future, but we know it now to have been distant future, uh, verses 11 through 17 of Amos chapter 9. In a review, just for a moment on the lion's roar, we indicated that Amos associates the lion roaring with God, roaring in judgment against Israel. If you've read C.S. Lewis, and I trot him out again, uh, in the Narnia Tales, you know that one of the chief characters in the Narnia Tales is Aslan, the lion, the great lion who is the god figure within the tales of Narnia. He has one of the most fascinating views of creation that I have ever read in all of my life outside the scripture. In fact, it helped me understand the scripture. And so if you can think for a moment of, of his god figure, Aslan, who is the lion, bringing Narnia into existence by a sound which is proceeding from Aslan the lion, you'll get it and perhaps uh, an idea of what is meant by God speaking. Although Amos speaks of God uh, giving his voice in judgment and creating conditions through his voice, we see a relief or a comparison against that with the lion's creative word. The lion was pacing to and fro about that empty land and singing his new song. It was softer and more lilting than the song by which he had called up the stars and the sun, a gentle, rippling music. As he walked and sang, the valley grew green with grass. It spread out from the lion like a pool. It ran up the sides of the little hills like a wave. In a few moments, it was creeping up the lower slopes of the distant mountains, making that young world every moment softer. All this time, the lion's song and his stately prowl to and fro backwards and forwards, was going on. What was alarming was that at each turn he came a little nearer. Polly, who's the girl in this story, was finding the song more and more interesting because she thought she was beginning to see the connection between the music and the things that were happening. When a line of dark firs sprang up on a ridge about a hundred yards away, she felt they were connected with a series of deep, prolonged notes which the lion had sung a second before. And when he burst into a rapid series of lighter notes, she was not surprised to see primnote roses suddenly appearing in all directions. Thus, with an unspeakable thrill, she felt quite certain that all the things were coming, as she said, out of the lion's head. When you listened to his song, you heard the things he was making up. When you looked around you, you saw them. And then she goes on to describe, or C.S. Lewis does, can you imagine... Oh, wait a minute. The lion was singing still, but now the song had once more changed. It was more like what we would call a tune, but it was also far wilder. Can you imagine a stretch of grassy land bubbling like water in a pot? For that is really the best description of what was happening. In all directions, it was swelling into humps. They were of very different sizes, some no bigger than molehills, some as big as wheelbarrows, two the size of cottages. And the humps moved and swelled till they burst. And the crumbled earth poured out of them, and from each hump there came out an animal. The moles came out just as you might see a mole come out in England. The dogs came out, barking the moment their heads were free, and struggling as you've seen them do when they are getting through a narrow hole in a hedge. The stags were the queerest to watch, for of course the antlers came up a long time before the rest of them, so that at first Diggory thought they were trees. The frogs, who all came up near the river, went straight into it with a plop-plop and a loud croaking. The panthers, leopards, and... Things of that sort sat down at once to wash the loose earth off their hindquarters and then stood up against the trees to sharpen their front claws. Showers of birds came out of the trees. Butterflies fluttered. Bees got to work on the flowers as if they hadn't a second to lose. But the greatest moment of all was when the biggest hump broke like a small earthquake and out came the sloping back, the large wise head, and the four baggy trousered legs of an elephant. And now you could hardly hear the song of the lion. There was so much cawing, cooing, crowing, braying, neighing, baying, barking, lowing, bleeding, and trumpeting. The voice of God speaking things that are not into existence is the same voice which the prophetic word is declaring to us is the voice which brings to an end the existence of things which he has created. 
Amos, thus in his second sermon at Bethel, the sanctuary, brings us to the idea of the moral and spiritual collapse of the nation of Israel, which would precede invasion. Amos, in fact, is prophesying some four decades before the invasion will actually occur. In this particular section of the book of Amos, which goes from 3.9 through 6.14, we see that it is also set off in brackets. For in verse 11 of chapter 3, we see Amos saying, An adversary shall surround the land, and he closes it in chapter 6, verse 14, by saying, I will raise up against you a nation. Amos shows in this particular segment of the book how God will accomplish his judgment, and he probes the reasons for God's anger. In this section on the moral and spiritual conditions which precede the invasion, Amos does essentially three things. He diagnoses the sins of society, chapter 3, verse 9 through 4.13. He shows the remedy which has been refused by Israel, chapter 5. And he gives a certain conclusion to the whole matter, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. We look just briefly at each of these themes. His diagnosis of his society is basically twofold. His society is a society without justice, and in his society there is religion without spirituality, the two fundamental ills that bother him, and which I might as well say bother the world today. A society without justice. As probed by Amos in chapter 3, verse 9 through 4, 3, he indicates that in that society without justice, God will bring an end to those who think that might makes right. Thus, in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, he shows that the violence and oppression which is, in e which is in Israel will be brought to a definite end. In fact, he summons the enemies of Israel, Assyria and Egypt, to watch from the mountains of the land the destruction of the nation. A real, sort of, so to speak, stick in the rib at Israel to saying, You are so ungodly that even the most ungodly nations will gather to watch your doom. Also, he indicates in this section of uh, society without justice that God will bring an end to the idea that religion and money buy security. Thus, he says in verses 13 through 15, For Israel expected that in the day of adversity it could simply grab hold of the horns of the altar. That was its religion rabbit, so to speak. Its rabbit's foot was in religion. When I was a kid, by the way, growing up in church, I heard people talk about getting a hold of the horns of the altar and how important it was to grab hold of the horns. And I would look around at our altar and I'd try to find some horns. And I was, of course, thinking of trumpets that you blow. And I couldn't find any. And I never could figure out what it was to grab hold of the horns of the altar. Now, much later in my life, I've, of course, discovered that the ancient altars on which animals were sacrificed were four, were, were actually square or rectangular, and that protruding out of each of the four sides was a hook, a curved hook, which was called a horn. On that curved hook, meat, which was being prepared for sacrifice, was often hung. When a person was in trouble for having committed some crime, whether it was an Israeli altar or even the altars that were dedicated to pagan deities, there was a point at which if a person sued for mercy, he could grab hold of the horns of the altar. And particularly in pagan religions, if he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar, that was a sanctuary and a safe place. With Israel's worship, God ordained that the guilty person could not simply escape judgment if he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. For if he were guilty, he had to pay the punishment. But the requirements were not quite as strict in other religions of the time. And to grab hold of the horns of the altar was, was meant to have a place of safety when you are guilty. And Isaiah simply declares of his society that God will cut the horns of the altars off so that there is no place to grab hold of it all. Religion is no security in and of itself. He also indicates that money, which many people think provides security, will also be brought to an end. And the opulence of his period is no more fittingly seen than in verse 15 about the winter house and the summer house and the houses of ivory and the great houses coming to an end. Then in verses 1 through 3, he describes the end of opulent living which has occurred at the expense of others. And in a classic put-down, he calls the high elitist female society of the capital city of Samaria a bunch of cows. He describes them in verse 1 of chapter 4 as cows of Bashan, and then goes on to reflect how in their high society they oppress the poor who crush the needy, and they sick their husbands on, saying to their husbands, in effect, earn more so we can enjoy more. 
not reckoning with the fact that their pushing of their husbands into injustice is fueling the anger of God. Therefore, those who have been high and dainty in their lifestyle and ignored the needs of the oppressed will be let off certainly with hooks in their mouth into judgment. Amos, in this section, also on the diagnosis of the ills of society, talks about religion without spirituality. He decries religious formalism in verses 4 and 5, knowing that the places of the religious centers of Israel are Bethel and Gilgal, ancient places where, by the way, Israel in times past had really walked with God. Bethel was where Abraham had built an altar upon coming into Palestine. It was where Jacob had met God and seen the vision of the latter. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept when Israel was in the land. It was a place where Samuel visited annually. Gilgal, which was located between Jericho and the Jordan River, was the base of operations for Israel when it entered into the Promised Land under Joshua. And it was there at Gilgal that a wilderness generation was, sanct was circumcised in covenant to the Lord. It was at Gilgal also that manna had ceased and the 40-year supply of heavenly food came to an end. But these sacred places had now been adulterated by false worship and by golden calves. It is a heart-rending thing to see that places and doctrines and truths which were sacred to one generation become possibly to another generation, a generation away from God, only a place of sacrilege. And such sorrow Amos is confounded with, that these ancient places should now simply be sites of religious formalism, of really excess in religious observances which have no inward meaning. If ever, by the way, in any part of Scripture, we are warned against the performance of spiritual obligations without the inner vitalizing spirit of God, it is in Amos. For him, the sacrifices and the tithes and the offerings are a reproach. In fact, he notes the abundance of Israel's religiosity and formal worship. It was required in the Pentateuch, for example, that farmers need only present their tithes every three years. But the religious excess was such that tithes were presented every three days. It was necessary, as we see in the book of Samuel, to only present offerings once a year. But the religious ones presented their offerings every morning and published them. That is to say, they let people know what they were giving. A phenomenon, by the way, which has not escaped our times today, nor has it even escaped charismatic circles, of recognition for giving. Such is a condition which Amos cannot approve, for it smacks simply of outward self-pleasing and outward self-promoting devices. He indicates uh, also in this section on religion without spirituality that God speaking to them has been devoid of response. Thus he says in verse 6, in order to correct them from the error of their ways, God sent famine, which is represented poetically in the phrase cleanness of teeth, but they did not return or hear his call. He also sent a drought in verses 6 and 7 and 8, but that produced no godly results. He also sent a plague upon vegetation in verse 9, and yet as well, that produced no godly results. He sent a pestilence upon things living in verse 10 of chapter 4, but that produced no godly results. Then God himself moved in direct judgment against the land, but again, that produced no godly results. We see a formal type of spirituality which does not look for the hand of God in the events of life. Therefore, there is the inevitable confrontation because of religion without spirituality. God himself will prepare to meet Israel. And thus, Israel is to be prepared. And we find a key verse in Amos, verse 12, a verse we have seen, by the way, of highway markers and signs, perhaps particularly if you've traveled in areas where they have not been, uh, these kinds of things. Prepare to meet your God. And Amos says of God that God will not be put off by a show of religion or by uh, endlessly ignoring his warnings. God is sovereign over things visible, verse 13. The things visible are the mountains. He is sovereign over things invisible, the wind. He is sovereign over things rational, the mind of man. He has executive control over all of his creation so that there is no place beyond his reach. Even the heights or are, are beneath his feet. Thus it is said he treads on the heights of the earth. As tall as the heights seem to the eye of man, yet they are beneath the feet of God. And he is the Lord of hosts, possessing every conceivable power. The diagnosis then has been laid. 
And in chapter 5, Amos goes on to talk about the remedy which God has offered and which has been refused. This section is kicked off by a lament, verses 1 through 3, where Amos indicates that there are two things that cannot happen for Israel once God moves in judgment. One thing that happens is that Israel itself will not have the strength to come back. And secondly, no one will have the strength to raise her back up. Once it has been scattered, it will be scattered. And by the way, we see the devastating nature of this prophecy and the fact that in Jesus' time there was the region of Samaria, the half-breed theological and racial remains of this kingdom which the prophet Amos prophesied against, a people literally that were no more, contrary to the British Israelis' theory that holds that the ten tribes migrated to America and that's how we got the American Indians. They will be forsaken, and there will be none to raise her up. There is a call to reformation as a part of this remedy, but in this call to reformation, uh, there is continued refusal. Thus, the first call to reformation is a spiritual reformation, verses 4 through 13. And the next call is a moral revelation or a reformation in verses 14 through 20. And we'll skip on lightly through these parts because I want to spend most of our time in chapter 7 and following. And there is even a call for a religious reformation, a, re a reformation of religious observances in verses 21 through 27 of chapter 5, where God says, in effect, I'm fed up with your meetings, I'm fed up with your sacrifices, I'm fed up with your music, I demand righteousness. And I demand a moral response. And if I don't get it, you will be turned over to other gods. And in an insightful word, in verse 26 of chapter 5, Amos says, You shall take up Sakath your king, and Kaiwan your star gods, your images, which you made for yourselves. Understanding the nature of these gods is helpful to get at what Amos here is really saying. For it was an ancient practice common to practice uh, processionals with the gods. And the idols were carried around in a procession, and wherever the procession started from, that's where it would end. It so happens that Sakath was the Assyrian god of war, who was identified with the planet Saturn, which also would be called Kaiwan. Therefore, Israel was taking up Assyrian gods. Was it taking up Assyrian gods? Therefore, let it go where these gods are going. Israel will wind up in captivity to Assyria your religious procession will return to its base. And what a moral truth that is for things today, that what you serve will lead you to whatever you're serving. If you're following a particular path that is away from God, it will lead you in the direction of captivity and bondage. The conclusion in this section of, of a collapse of, of the nation, the moral and spiritual collapse which precedes invasion, is that self-confidence and self-exaltation of the people come to an end. In verses 1 through 7, Amos says, the first of society will be the first to go into captivity. Again, he's using play on words, where he says, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel come, all you chief people who lie upon beds of ivory. How would you like that kind of a way to go to sleep at night? I don't think it's as good as a waterbed. But in Israeli society, in, in Israeli society, it was the thing to do. It was fashion. I would think it would be rather hard. But, you know, the price people will pay for fashion <laughs> and uh, for having something that no one else has. Woe to those who lie upon beds of ivory, stretch themselves upon couches, eating positions, eat lambs from their flocks and calves from the midst of their stalls, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp like David invented for themselves instruments of music, drink wine in bowls, they're drinking it in plenty of supply, and anoint themselves with the finest oils. What he is saying about a society is that here is a, here is a society who puts a premium on luxurious food, uh, music, uh, excessive drink, and cosmetics, the anointing of oneself. But in its desire to be the first in the enjoyment of comfort, it is going to be the first to go into exile. And he indicates as a comparison in verses 8 through 14, the Lord's estimate of Israel. The Lord ab ab abhors Israel, verse 8. The Lord is alienated from Israel in verses 9 and 10. In fact, the time is going to come when the nation is going to be invaded. And a man's house is going to have devastation. In fact, when he is bringing out the bones of those who remain in his house, 
and someone cries out, Is there still anyone with you? He shall say, No. And he shall say, Hush, we must not mention the name of the Lord. What Amos is saying is that the time will come when people will be afraid to speak the name of God, for they will know that however they speak it, God will not answer them. It will be alienation in the extreme degree. And God will put enmity between himself and Israel. For the moment, uh, as Amos reviews the foreign policy of Israel, he is, he is looking at recent military victories that have been won by the land. Victories which have occurred in verse 13 at Lodibar and Karnayam. Uh, insignificant victories which evidently Israel thought it was uh, really super. It was Israel's Mayaguez. It's a great swatting of the fly. Uh, in actual fact, Amos is saying these victories are not going to spare you the judgment of God at all. They are very small. And in again, a prophetic play on words, the word Lodibar in the Hebrew literally means a nothing. And what Amos is saying is your greatest achievements are great nothings. In chapter 7, he changes voice and perhaps again rises to preach another sermon. His sermon on the moral collapse having culminated showing that judgment is inevitable. In the visions of God's judgment in chapter 7 verse 1 through chapter 9 verse 10, Amos spins off five different visions which he has of the coming judgment of God upon the land. And here he is exercising his true capacity as a prophet to see, for the one basic definition of a prophet is a seer, one who has visions of what God is going to accomplish. His first vision is a vision of locusts. In verses 1 through 3, which would devour the land. Strikingly, however, this vision does not have a culmination. For when Amos sees the vision, he prays that God will spare the land from the locust plague. And therefore, it is said, God repented, or the Lord repented. That is to say, the Lord allowed the prayer of intervention to alter his course of judgment. This is a common prophetic theme, that if the people of God will repent, then the Lord will stay the judgment which he has promised. Amos then sees a second vision, a vision of fire devouring the land, verses 4 through 6. Again, when he sees this devastation coming upon the land, he is moved to pray that God will spare the land from judgment. Again, God answers the prayer and the land is spared from that judgment. The third vision which Amos sees is the vision of a plumb line. Now, uh, if you're not a constructioner like I am, you may have a difficult time understanding what in the world a plumb line is. I don't know. Do they still use plumb lines in construction? Do they do? Well, then many of you know what they are, but I understand it's a, a device uh, which you hang over the edge of a building or the side of a building. It is a line. And as you're building up that line, you're building the wall so that it is even with the line, so that the building rise, rises cleanly and perpendicularly from the land so that it's not the kind of building or wall that I'd build that would go in and out somewhat like this, but a straight line. And the vision which Amos sees is the, the Lord is holding a plumb line to Israel. What he is really measuring is, has the nation of Israel built according to the law, the line, the plumb line, which he has given for it? And instead, God, of course, is finding the building very crooked and very out of line. Therefore, there is no staying of God's judgment this time. There is no prayer of intervention because God has tested Israel in his sieve of history and found the nation wanting. There comes as an interruption between the visions. There are five visions in all, locust fire, plumb line, a basket of summer fruit, and a smiting of the sanctuary. In between the third and the fourth vision, there is what is called an historical interlude where Amos backs off momentarily to talk about the intensity that his message is creating in regard to opposition in the land. There is a person who opposes him, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, who is the king's own chaplain. And he brings a false report about Amos. This morning, I indicated that Amos um, is the representative of the charismatic and Amaziah a representative of the ecclesiastic. Now, these are technical terms and... I want to use the word charismatic not to describe a modern-day charismatic, but to use it in the biblical sense of one who speaks simply because God has anointed him to speak. A charismatic is one who has been endowed with the gift of God. And in this case, it was the gift of prophecy. But against Amos stood Amaziah, the ecclesiastic, the person who owed his position to the choice of someone else and who therefore was reportable to someone else, the one who had the party line, 
who preached the correct doctrine as interpreted by the king and the establishment. These two persons now converge. Amaziah meets Amos at Bethel. He first of all distorts what Amos has been saying by indicating that Amos has been conspiring against the king and indeed has prophesied that Jeroboam would die by the sword. We can look through the prophecy of Amos and, of course, find these words are false. It is the deliberate intention of the ecclesiastic, the person who owes not his allegiance to God but to the church establishment, to distort the message of the true prophet and say something else against him. Even as there have been those within the history of the church who have refused revival and spiritual movement which have arisen and said, well, that's of the devil. A kind of deliberate distortion which is picturesque of the ecclesiastic response. He assassinates Amos' character by saying in verse 12, O oh, seer, go away, flee to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. What he's saying in between the lines is, Hey you, if you want to earn a living by prophesying, don't prophesy here. Go back to Judah where they'll pay you bread to prophesy. But don't con these people into supporting you. And yet Amos has said nothing about deriving his support from the persons that he is ministering to. The assassination of character is followed by a direct forbidding of Amos to say anything more. Never prophesy again at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary. It's a temple of the kingdom. Get out of here. We can't stand to hear what you're saying. We must ignore truth. Amos, the charismatic, responds. He indicates to Amaziah that he does not have the natural capacity for a prophet. Thus he indicates, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son. That is his way of of saying, I wasn't trained to be a prophet, I'm not a prophet by inclination, uh, I am simply here because God has called me. And he indicates further in verse 15 that he is not there by personal choice. Rather, he has been summoned to preach a word against Israel. And then that word against Israel turns into a personal word against Amaziah. He promises that Amaziah, because he resisted the word of God, will experience degradation. His wife will be a harlot in that city. His sons and daughters would fall by the sword. He promises bereavement. And he promises that Amaziah will die in exile in an unclean land. It does not pay to resist the voice of God, by the way. In our individual lives, we will find that there are continually two voices coming at us. The voice which is representative of the Amaziah-like voice, which, which is against the Spirit of God, a voice which is saying, hey, don't really become radical in your faith. Don't really give yourself to God. Just do your own thing. Just go the way that's popular. The way that people in the mass are going. The general way. And then there's the voice of God. The clear conviction of God. Which is saying to you, here is the way. Walk in it. Know the certainty of your fate by the direction of the voice that you're listening to. The voice of the mass or the voice of God? Amos continues with his descriptions of visions of judgment. He next comes to a basket of summer fruit, which he sees. O Amos, God says, what do you see? Chapter 8. And I said, a basket of summer fruit. What is significant about this? Well, a basket of summer fruit is a basket of fruit which is really ripe. Have you ever been around really ripe tomatoes? What's the next stage if you don't eat them? Oh, can't describe what happens to those kinds of things. Or bananas that go ripe and then you don't eat them and then what happens next? Shall I go on? Apples, oranges. And Israel, as Amos sees the vision, is indeed a basket of summer fruit. It has been picked and rottenness is ahead of it. Therefore, Amos says, the songs of the temple shall become wailings, the dead bodies shall be many, and there shall be silence in every place where they are cast out. He goes on uh, to indicate that in this Israel being right for judgment, it is right because of the greed of the rich and the oppression of the poor. The rich are so greedy that when the new moon comes up, which is to be a day of religious observance, they cannot wait until it is over, saying, when can we sell grain? And as for the Sabbath... They cannot wait for it to be over so that they can offer wheat for sale and make the balances tricky or deceitful. They make the ephoth small and the shekel great. The ephoth was the measurement, about eight gallons. And you're selling eight gallons worth of stuff, only you make it small 
So instead of selling truly eight gallons, you're selling maybe six gallons instead, and you're making the shekel large. And by the way, in all the archaeological excavations done of the biblical period of the Old Testament, I was reading just this week that there is yet one excavation to show two weights that are of the same weight. <laughs> that practicing imbalance in weights was an extremely common practice, and it was a way of deceit. Therefore, again, there is that mention of buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Israel will be punished for this. And as it is punished, by the way, one of the marks of its punishment will be the fact that it will be sent into exile. And in the day when it is sent into exile, it will have a famine for the word of God. Verses 11 through 12 are significant. The days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine in the land. Fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. What Amos is saying is simply that persons, when they are in prosperity, if they neglect, ignore or even deride God's spokesman and God's word, will, in days of suffering, be searching frantically for someone to speak to them God's word and shall not find it. And the famine for the word is still a famine in Israel today. An inability to find within the scriptures the living God whose voice speaks through them. Isaiah's fifth and last vision is the vision of the smiting of the sanctuary. This altar, this pagan altar which Israel had built at Bethel, he sees the Lord as smiting the capitals. The capitals would be the head of the pillars which supported the altar or the sanctuary that was built there. And he indicated that when God smote this place, that there would be an impossibility of escape. If people thought they could go to the place of the dead, shoal to escape, they would find that God would be there. If they thought they could climb up to heaven, they would find that God would be there. If they thought they could hide themselves on the mountain, Carmel, God would find them there. And then Amos goes into the mythology of the period, which held that at the very bottom of the sea there was a serpent, which was beyond the reach of God, a leviathan. And, and if anybody, anybody went down there, they were outside God's reach. Amos says, if you go down to the bottom of the sea, even where the serpent or the leviathan is, God's judgment will be executed there. If you go into exile, God's judgment will be executed there as well. For God has power to judge, power in creation and power within history. God will effect his judgment, certain and total. Now, when we read Amos, I think we have to read with a certain measure of what I would call historical respect and awe. For here are words which all came to pass in a devastating way, with a people which numbered well into the hundreds of thousands being carried away into exile and captivity. An exile which was needless, as are our sins and the punishment of those sins really needless. The exile really in the Old Testament, when we overlay it against New Testament spiritual truth, I think represents eternal judgment. There is no necessity for ever experiencing the eternal judgment of God. There is no, necess no necessity for being outside of God's loving care for the eternity. For God has given us his provision to cling to and to hold to. But just as his law is inexorable and judgment will ultimately come within history to Israel, so God's judgment is inexorable within the distance of eternity. Just as it is certain that Israel suffered the incurment of God's wrath and was judged, 722 B.C. by the Assyrians, so it is certain that if we spurn the voice of God, we ourselves will stand in under his judgment. All of the book of Amos until this moment has been a book of judgment and an outpouring of the subject of God's wrath for the moral and spiritual transgressions of the people. But in verses 11 through 17, he jumps to a distant day where there is a prophetic word as a promise for the nation in which Amos promises three things. David's booth would be restored. Edom and the nations would be possessed by Israel. And there would be secure prosperity. What does he mean when he says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it in the days as of old. He is talking to a people who had broken off from the royal rulership of David's house. He's talking to a people whose dynasty now did not include the royal dynasty of David, but had kings which were different from David's line, who in all practical effect had left the government of David. 
Amos leaps into the period of time past the judgment and says, The time will come, O Israel, when David's booth, that outdoors kind of shelter, that lean-to, which has been fallen down, will be restored, and it will be rebuilt as in the days of old. I would submit to you that the fulfillment of that prophecy began when Jesus of Nazareth came in the flesh and began to possess that kingdom which had been promised David, possessed it fully in his earthly ministry in the spiritual sense, and in the age to come will possess it fully in the material sense. So here is a prophecy which has yet to fully be fulfilled and come to pass when the Lord himself, who is the only legitimate heir that can claim he is from David, will reign and rule. Does it ever strike you, by the way, as you look at the genealogies in the New Testament, Matthew and Luke, that there is a decided purpose for them? Because the genealogies show Jesus' link with David. And because he has that lineage link with David, he is entitled, he is the heir to sit on the throne. It would be impossible if you looked at modern Jewry today to find a descendant of David. Who in the world can come before humanity and say, I have the genealogical records for the last 2,000 years, and they show that I am a descendant of King David, and therefore I have a right to rule on the throne of David? It's absolutely impossible. The genealogical records are gone. As early as 70 A.D., when Jerusalem was sacked and burned by the Romans, the genealogical records were lost. And what Jew is there today that can prove I am descendant of David, therefore I can sit on the throne. That's why today Israel has a, has a prime minister and has a parliament. It does not have a monarchy. It does not have a king because there is no longer a line of succession. How then can this prophecy come to pass? Except through Jesus, whose lineage is from David and who will raise up David's house. Not only that, Amos prophesies that Edom and the nations will be possessed by Israel. Edom here is selected for special reference because it represents all of the enemies of Israel's long history. It was the enemy which refused to allow Israel to pass through its land in the wilderness. And typically and prophetically, it represented enmity toward the household of God and the people of God. Therefore, Edom and all the nations which were against God shall be possessed by God. And the nation which belongs to God will be raised up and take their possessions as its own. Then in verses 13 through 15, the Lord goes on to indicate that there will come a time of unparalleled prosperity. It is possible to spiritualize this and say that when we come to Jesus Christ, we have unparalleled inward spiritual prosperity. But I think that in looking for the fulfillment of this prophecy, we err if we simply look for a spiritual fulfillment, for it appears to point to a time yet to come. When the Lord has returned from heaven and Israel has been grafted back into the purpose of God within history and the nation again becomes ruled personally by David's house in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the prosperity of the land will be unparalleled. This is why, of course, as we look at Israel and the world scene today, we recognize that this tiny land has a purpose in God's history. I would like, by the way, to be at the University of Tel Aviv when... Uh, the Lord comes from heaven, or that is, when he returns from heaven with all of his saints. Because then we are going to see, in a, in a few moments' time after the mopping up of Armageddon, the Lord bring a fertility and a prosperity to the land which is absolutely unparalleled. And this time, within Israel's history, its economic prosperity will go hand in hand with its spiritual prosperity. Something that never happened before in its history will happen now through the hand of God. Now again, we want to take all of this lengthy and rather bulky section of teaching, now that we've tried to look at it expositionally or exegetically and historically, to apply it to our lives. What is God seeking to say to us through this part of his word? Four things, again, come to me as I look at this passage for this evening. The first is this. Is there a recent experience in my life through which God has been speaking to me and I have ignored his speaking in that experience. We've seen tonight in the book of Amos that time after time, God sought to speak to Israel and they simply ignored his speaking. Particularly, he spoke to them in regard to national, in natural calamity and reverses. As you look at your life, is there an experience which you have recently had through which God is seeking to do something in your life, but you're ignoring it, putting it off, resisting it? 
continuing in your same rebellious, antagonistic spirit toward God and others. God is saying, I'm speaking to you. I want to get through to you. Will you allow me to get through and shape and change your life? A second application which I see from Amos is simply this. Is there any area in my life which God has repeatedly spoken to me about and I have still stubbornly refused to hear him and continued in disobedience toward him? God spoke to Israel about its sin not once, but time after time after time. And only after continued, repeated stubbornness toward God did God intervene in judgment. So the ancient word of God becomes a living word as we look at it in this moment. To look within the depths of our heart and ask ourselves, is there any area within me which stubbornly resists God's clear call in my life to repentance? Some area of life which I am clinging to and I say, no matter what, I will not let go. I'll have my way and that's it. God is speaking to you afresh tonight to yield to him on that very area of life which you hold and which you refuse to give in. He wants to plant his flag of conquest in the center of your rebellious heart that you may respond to him and know him in truth. Another thing which I think Amos is saying is he is asking us how we feel about the day of the Lord. For Amos, in one of the chapters which we looked at this evening, in fact, several of the chapters, he notes that the day of the Lord for Israel has been thought to be a time of great blessing for it. But he is saying, not at all. If you're unprepared to meet God, the day of the Lord is going to be a time of great judgment. When I think about the Lord's return, how do I feel about that return? Do I get all tensed up with apprehension? <laughs> do I really know deep in my heart that if the Lord returned, there really is granite in my shoes? That I really would not go up to meet him? Do you know I really believe that you know, every one of us in this room knows, if you could visualize it for a moment, if the Lord were to return this evening, what is your walk with the Lord? Are you justified by his grace? Are you ready to meet him? Are your sins forgiven? Are they confessed? How do you feel about the forthcoming day of the Lord when the Lord returns in visible righteousness to reign on earth? And then the last thing which comes to me from this scripture is, are my spiritual eyes open to see God's work in the common occurrences of life? Isaiah, or Amos rather, took something as common as a plumb line or a basket of summer fruit and saw in it the working of God. And life is full of windows through which we see the nature of God. Daily experiences which we have, experiences with our friends, with our children, incidences which we go through, things which we read, which are alive with God, if we will but open our eyes to see them. The Lord wants us to see many a place that is alive and active with his activity that before we have looked at and simply not seen anything at all. The seer, the prophet, the person upon whom the Spirit of God rests is an individual whose eyes are alive to the possibility of seeing God's love and seeing God's work. Shall we pray? Our Father, as we come to a conclusion of this day, we quiet our hearts in this moment to once more hear your word for our lives. And as we hear that word, like Amos, our ears are filled with the sound of the lion's roar, your roar from heaven, a roar of judgment upon the world, a, war, a roar of certain conquest, a roar which manifests that indeed you are king and lord over all things. And we look at ourselves in light of this, and we simply say tonight, O Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have called me not to be your prey in judgment, but to be at your side when the world is on fire. And we simply cry out to you, Lord Jesus, that we have found a righteousness in you that we did not have of ourselves. And we've found forgiveness from you that we were not able to have even toward ourselves. And that because of your love and grace, we can stand confidently in your presence. This message this morning as well as tonight, Lord, has been a message directed at the depths of our conscience.
to see where we are with you and to answer with either confidence in our heart that we are right with you and we do not fear the prospect of your coming, nor are we ready for any kind of judgment because our sins are behind us. This message today has either given us that confidence or it has aroused alarm within our heart, alarm that we continue to disobey you and walk in our own way. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray for each one here that none of us would be so faithless who in the face of your love would continue to walk in rebellion and disobedience. And I just in this moment, Lord, would see what you want to do in our lives. It's very clear, Lord, that as we're gathered here this evening, there are people with real hurts. You certainly have not planned these messages today as though accidentally. There are real griefs in life there are real serious emotional and home disturbances which are represented among us this evening caused by getting off the track, caused by not obeying you, caused by stubbornness, resistance, and ironness. But, O oh Lord, with you in our heart, there is healing and redemption, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Let your word come to us clearly in these moments, I pray, through Jesus' name. Through Jesus' name.